Okay, let's reposition this just a little bit. My poor little iPad. Okay, so um, I still got uh, blues and uh, blues and soul singer Lauren Mitchell behind me. Let's see, yeah, I think that'll work. Um, so I've got blues and uh, blues and soul singer Lauren Mitchell behind me. I'm working on her portrait. Uh, let me see. There's the original image. And so this is what I'm trying to go for. Why does it look like? Looks like she has no nostril on this side. So, you know, there's issues. She's still in stick figure stage. I'm working on her and I'm working off of a limited palette. So I'm choosing very carefully what colors I use. I'm out of all kinds of paints, including my favorite, Transparent Earth Red by Gamblin Paint, Gamblin Artist Colors, but I can't do anything about it right now. I can't afford it. So I've just got to keep painting, but finding colors that work for me. I am not out of, however, my favorite painting medium that's around here somewhere. There you are. Neo McGill. Let's see. Get it in there. Sorry, the camera's right by a window. There we go. Uh, Neo McGill, my favorite painting medium, oil painting medium. I'm not out of. I still got a lot left. So I'm able to keep working. I just have to think in a different direction than I originally planned. And because I don't have transparent parent or thread, um, I'm trying to keep in mind that at some point I will be applying Neo McGilp and transparent or thread and pushing things into the background. But right now it's not a possibility. So we're just going to stick with the stick figure stage and trying to adjust and readjust the lines, the, the contours of the, of the body, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I'm not going to turn on my air conditioning today. I'm determined because the camera, the iPad, is sitting right next to it. If I turn it on, that's all you're going to hear. But I'm just going to try and work under a fan. And we're going to finish up The Judgment of Paris by Ross King. And as I've mentioned in many videos now, this is when the art world was turned on its head. It started going from... Uh, classical and you know relying on what they already knew to you know what what was conceived uh, be what was believed to be beautiful and the only um, type of something okay, I'm working under a fan uh, anyway it was they were painting in classical style the um, impressionists were just coming over the horizon and as I've been listening for Almost 20 years, the Impressionists were trying to push their work out into the Salon, the great Salon show um, held every year in Paris, and they were always rejected over and over and over again over classic, classical artists. You know, at that time, that's what art was. There was nothing new, but they were on, we, they were on the brink of not only um, uh, Historical changes, because the Prussians invaded Paris or invaded France and, you know, did a lot of damage in burnt Rome, burnt Paris and stuff. So anyway, they were on the brink of the Impressionist period taking over, just the art world being completely revolutionized, and they didn't realize it. You know, they kept saying, this is not a figure, Suzanne, this is not how we paint, and made fun of him, mocked him, uh, belittled him, and, and ignored his artwork. Uh, Manet, Monet, all the rest that we've talked about. And, uh, but anyway, we're at the, the point in the book where it's really starting to change. And Manet had a gallerist go into his gallery and buy up one piece of work. And then he went back and bought more work. And then he bought more work. And so uh, what I've been listening to is the complete change, the, 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 the acceptance um, or of the acknowledgement of a brand new movement in artwork. And, I, you know, I find it um, hopeful. Because there's many periods, like right now, where I go through where I've had, you know, one sale. We've had one very good sale, and I'm very proud of it. And I'm very proud to have the, the people who purchased it purchase it. But then there's a long dry spell in between. And I go through these really horrible depressions and anxieties, and I think, oh, you know what, maybe I should just quit. And I've reached several points where I've um, 
called a friend of mine or a couple friends and said, come get my paints. I'm, I'm really all done. I'm tired of this. Um, I, I apparently I'm a failure and uh, because I can't get the um, I have really great support, but I can't get uh, the, the recognition and the um, acceptance or something like that that I really need to get just over the edge. These videos, by the way, are being shown around the world. I'm very, very lucky. I have thousands of people who follow me online, but I'm like Sisyphus with that rock pushing it uphill because I'm not 20, I'm not good looking, I'm not some pretty little ingenue standing there in a bikini painting, you know not even an ingenue, it was just, you know, some chick with mild amount of talent painting. I'm, I'm, I'm an artist, and I've been an artist my whole life, but I'm an artist who came about this style really late. And so, um, I've been rejected by many, 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 many galleries, many events, many shows, and usually I am mostly rejected in the communities that I live in, and then once I leave, they're like, oh my god, she was a genius, she was fabulous, she's so awesome, I love her work, I follow her online, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, these are being shown around the world. I know I have an audience around the world, but I can't get the, the um, attention and recognition from uh, more galleries that, that will um, that's supposedly sell contemporary art, but, you know, whatever. Anyway, it's a dry period. I get depressed, filled with anxiety, like right now, because um, I've got a lot of things on the table, and I just want to keep moving. So I go through this thing where I say, I'm going to give them up my paints. I'm giving away my paints. I'm done. I'm a failure. Let's take them off the stretchers and give the stretchers away. We'll roll up the paintings, and maybe one day something good will happen. But then I feel a little bit better about life and I keep going. So today I'm going to keep going and listening to Ross King's book, The Judgment of Paris, because I'm Manet just, well, I think in this disc that we're about to listen to, sold a whole bunch of work and I go, oh, okay, it can still happen. It can still happen. It can happen. So let's put this on before I start to cry. I'll also be eating my lunch, which will be incredibly interesting. Gustave mm -hmm. mm -hmm. controversy at the 1872 salon and Oops. the exclu Chap. The exclusion of Gustave Courbet was not to be the only controversy at the 1872 salon as widespread rejections by the selection committee caused the clamour for a salon des refusés. A petition did the rounds, accusing the jurors of a favoritism and prejudice that are without precedent, and requesting space for an alternative exhibition. But Chardon showed himself as impervious as Novakov to all such demands. A number of artists had declined to submit work to the 1872 Salon. Claude Monet and Camille Pizarro had both come back from London. Monet bringing with him canvases of Hyde Park and the River Thames. Pizarro views of the South London suburbs of Norwood and Sydney. But no longer did they possess the desire to precipitate themselves into the unforgiving artistic fray that was the Salon. Monet and Paul Cézanne, who was back from the south of France with Hortense Fiquet, had good reason to be disillusioned with the process, since in the last years of the Second Empire their works had constantly been rejected. Edgar Degas, had likewise decided to turn his back on a system that looked no more encouraging under the Third Republic than when Napoleon III was in power. Renoir, however, broke ranks with the Batignolles painters and submitted a pair of canvases, Parisians in Algerian costume and the riders in the Bois de Boulogne. The actions of his friends no doubt seemed justified when both were returned unceremoniously stamped with a red R. Another painter who broke rank albeit with more success, was Edouard Manet. The last few months had been remarkable ones for Manet. In the decade before the siege and the commune, he had managed to sell only a couple of his paintings. These had gone to close friends, one of whom, Théodore Duret, paid for his portrait in 1868 
by giving Manet a case of cognac. This lack of commercial success had become more acutely dismaying to Manet as his 40th birthday approached. One of the reasons for his depressive illness in the summer of 1871 seems to have been the precarious state of his finances. In August, shortly before his doctor sent him to Boulogne, he had found himself obliged to ask Diolet for a loan of 700 francs. You can imagine how dire my need has been, he wrote to his friend. Yet one day, in the middle of January 1872, less than two weeks before observing his 40th birthday, Manet was visited in his studio by Paul Durand de Ruel, a picture dealer who owned a gallery in the Rue Lafitte. Durand de Ruel promptly purchased two of his canvases, paying Manet 1,600 francs. He then returned the following day, and to Manet's astonished pleasure, took away 23 more canvases, for which he arranged to pay 35,000 francs. On the spot, Durand Ruel later recalled, I bought everything he had. He thereby became the proprietor of, among others, the absinthe drinker, the street singer, the Spanish singer, the young man in the costume of a majo, Mademoiselle V in the costume of an espada, the dead Toreador, the dead Christ with angels, the fifer, the tragic actor, and the repose. Several days later, Durand Ruel returned once more to the Rue de Saint Petersburg and paid Manet 16,000 francs for yet another cartload of canvases. Included among his third batch was music in the Tuileries. Durand Ruel was in many ways an unlikely champion for the rebel angel of French painting. He was an extreme political conservative who feared and detested both democracy and republicanism. A friend and supporter of the Comte de Chambord, he believed that only the restoration of a hereditary monarchy could save France. Yet he was, above all, a practical businessman. He had taken control of the family firm at the age of 34, following the death of his father in 1865, and then begun vigorously to expand. He had specialised in landscapers, acquiring a virtual monopoly on Theodore Rousseau, when in 1866 he purchased 70 paintings directly from Rousseau's studio. When his business was threatened by the Franco-Prussian War, he escaped with his collection of canvases to London and opened a gallery in Bond Street. There he staged exhibitions that introduced the English public to the work of Corot, Corbet, Daubigny, Rousseau and Millet, as well as to two members of the new generation of French landscapers whose acquaintance he made in London, Monet and Pizarro. He also opened a gallery in Brussels, where in the acting name Place de Martyrs, he began impressing Belgian connoisseurs with works that had been on the receiving end of so many critical brickbacks in Paris. He had then returned to France at the end of 1871 to reopen his gallery in the Rue Lafitte and acquire more works by the new generation of painters. Delighted with his sales to Durand Ruel, Manet had sauntered into the Café Gaubois and mischievously inquired, Can you name an artist who can't flog 50,000 francs worth of paintings in a year? To which a chorus of his comrades replied predictably, You! Manet then happily disabused them of their misapprehension. These sales did not seem to have inspired him to go back to work, however, and so when the 23rd of March deadline arrived, he had no new salon painting to offer. He had obviously decided that his canvases of Lyon, riding a velocipede and playing croquet, were too frivolous in a year when the salon was meant to showcase the greatness of France. Unlike so many of his contemporaries, though, he was still determined to exhibit work. He therefore arranged to enter the Battle of the USS Kearsarge and the CSS Alabama, for which Durand Ruel had paid 3,000 francs. Painted in 1864, the work had received a I'm good posting press, on Twitter. notably from Philippe Bilti, when it appeared in the window of Alfred Cadal's shop. Manet may have chosen the painting for another reason as well. Its subject matter was topical, because though the famous naval battle was eight years old, the United States had begun seeking reparations from Great Britain for the damage inflicted on its shipping by the Alabama, which had been built at the shipyard of John Laird and Sons in Liverpool, despite the fact that Britain was supposedly neutral during the American Civil War. In 1871, the US Secretary of State, Hamilton Fish, had signed the Treaty of Washington, which provided for arbitration between Britain and America over what became known as the Alabama Claims. As Manet submitted his work to the 1872 jury, a panel that included the Emperor of Brazil, 
was convening in Geneva to discuss the reparations. It would eventually find in favour of the United States, which was awarded reparations of more than $15 million in gold. The Salon jury, in the meantime, found in favour of Manet, whose battle scene was accepted for the exhibition. Chapter 35, A Ring of Gold The sky stays a funereal grey. Between two dirty clouds, a yellow sun sometimes risks an arrow of gold. But the rain blunts the flaming dart, and sudden downpours sweep the roadways and the pavements, rolling in torrents of water along the Champs-Élysées. The chestnut trees drip on your head, and you must leap across the wide puddles that turn the asphalt into maps of seas and continents. Such were the inauspicious conditions under which, according to Emile Zola, the Salon of 1872 opened its doors. Worse still, the Salon opened ten days later than usual, on the 11th of May, because of delays in getting the Palais de Champs-Élysées cleaned and decorated following the equestrian exhibition, itself held for the first time in two years. But worst of all, the 2,000 paintings on show were, in the opinion of most critics, decidedly substandard. An English newspaper reported that the Salon has no picture of exceeding merit to boast of, besides which the general run of works exhibited is unquestionably below the average. Most French critics found themselves regretfully obliged to agree. One reviewer, bemoaning the meagre contributions, asked the question guaranteed to send chills down the spine of every Frenchman. Have we lost supremacy on the field of fine arts, as we have lost it on the field of battle? Are our artists, like our generals, the victims of a treacherous illusion in believing themselves invincible? It was a hideous question to contemplate in a year when the French hoped, as l'opinion nationale had declared, to show jealous Europe all that the genius of France could produce in the aftermath of its defeat. On the evidence of the 1872 Salon, genius seemed in a short supply among French painters as it had been among French commanders. The dearth of notable works at the Salon meant that Manet's naval battle, with its sinking ship and billows of black smoke, turned out to be an unexpected crowd pleaser. Manet was in any case the talk of the Salon, thanks to the much publicised purchase of his paintings by Durand Ruel a few months earlier. The Salon's critical pariah soon found himself on the receiving end of several column inches of generous praise. The battle of the USS Kearsarge and the CSS Alabama was singled out by a critic in La Rappelle as a strong, beautiful seascape, while Armand Silvestre, in L'Opinion Nationale, extolled it as one of the most interesting things in the Salon. The loudest applause came from Barbet de Aurevie, the reactionary Catholic and erstwhile friend of Baudelaire, who several months earlier had defended Courbet's exclusion. Edouard Manet, according to his critics, possesses no talent, he wrote in the <laughs> He is said to be a persistent and headstrong dauber, and in recent years he has been pitilessly ridiculed. But that does not imply he is ridiculous. No, far from it. He went on to cite Baudelaire's approval of Manet before celebrating the very simple and very powerful battle scene with a poetic conceit that implied the artist's mastery of seascape. Monsieur Manet, he wrote, has made like the Doge of Venice. He cast a ring, which I swear was a ring of gold, into the sea. Barbet de Aurevie was an old friend of Manet. As for that matter, was Armand Silvestre. But these enthusiastic reviews were no less gratifying for a man who had indeed been pitlessly ridiculed by the critics. Even his old nemesis, Albert Wolff, declined to savage the work. Wolff concentrated more on Manet's appearance, reassuring readers of Le Figaro that although his canvases may sometimes have conjured images of a long-haired, berry-wearing, pipe-smoking bohemian, in fact Manet was a man of the world, with a refined and ironic smile. Here was an artist, Wolff seemed to be saying, who was safe for bourgeois consumption. All in all, Manet could scarcely have hoped for a better result. He also had other reasons for celebrations that summer. A sportsman and art collector named Barrett commissioned him to paint a view of the horse races at the Hippodrome de Longchamp for the enticing sum of 3,000 francs. Then two days before Vabi de Olivet's review, he moved into a new studio. With his old atelier in the Rue Guillaume badly damaged, 
he had spent the previous year working in rented accommodation, not far from the apartment he shared with Suzanne and his mother. But on the 1st of July, fresh from his salon triumph, he signed a nine-year lease on an imposing studio down the street at 4 Rue de Saint-Petersbourg. Formerly used as a fencing school, the premises consisted of four rooms, including a kitchen and toilet facilities. The vast main room featured high ceilings, oak-panelled walls, a balcony, and an impressive fireplace whose looming overmantel was decorated with Corinthian pilasters. Parting with more of Durand Ruel's cash, he furnished the room such that it began to look more like a fashionable salon than the studio of a painter known for shocking canvases. Up the stairs and into the oversized room came a piano, a cheval glass, a Louis XV console table, a tapestry, some porcelain vases, crimson curtains, a crimson sofa covered with cushions, and a ceramic statue of a cat. More than simply an expression of Manet's own personal taste, this elegant decor was intended to impress prospective clients with his status and sophistication, to prove to wealthy men such as Barry that he was indeed safe for bourgeois consumption. At least one visitor, an art critic, was utterly charmed by Manet's impeccable refinement, effusing over the studio as a truly agreeable environment, very beautiful, charming, luxurious even. With a little imagination, we might believe ourselves to be in a room at the Louvre, or indeed one might almost have believed oneself inside Maisonnier's baronial halls in the Grand Maison. In fact, to some of Manet's friends from the Café Boubois, this stately and self-important studio smacked of a creeping conservatism, of a commitment more to the artistic ideals and ambitions of the pompiers than the actualists. In any case, it certainly did not look like the workplace of a man about to devote himself to painting en plein air. Nonetheless, the studio did include among its elegant objets two jarringly dissident souvenirs of the painter's old days as a critical abomination. Hanging proudly on the walls were both Le Déjeuner Soleil and Olympia, two works that not even Durand Ruel had mustered the courage to purchase. In many ways, Ernest Maisonnier had been lucky during the Franco-Prussian War. Thanks to his Europe-wide reputation, his studio in the Grand Maison was treated with far more deference than those of numerous other painters. Camille Pizarro had returned to Louvre-Sienne to discover how the enemy soldiers were using his house as a butcher's shop and his canvases as aprons on which to wipe their hands after they slit the throats of rabbits and chickens. His studio was heaped with dung, and only 40 of his 1,500 paintings oh. remained intact. Thomas Couture had lost more than 100 paintings and drawings after his house at villiers le bel 12 miles north of Paris, was expropriated by the invaders. Maisonnier, on the other hand, may have lost a number of his cows and horses, but his unwelcome guests had neither damaged nor looted his paintings. The fact that none of his works vanished under mysterious circumstances during the occupation indicated a certain level of discipline on the part of the Prussian soldiers, in view of the fact that many of Maisonnier's tiny masterpieces could easily have fit inside a kit bag or overcoat. Maisonnier, nonetheless, had a difficult time settling in the Grand Maison after its occupation by the Prussians. He had developed an almost pathological hatred of all Germans. In the weeks following the siege, Polite and ingratiating Prussian officers, hoping to engage the master in idle conversation, were treated to rude replies and slamming doors. Maisonnier became a recluse in his studio, and even when the Prussians finally departed, the memory of their presence was so obnoxious to him that he began contemplating a move from Poissy. To that end, therefore, he acquired a plot of land in the boulevard Melachelle, in the heart of the Batignol. The Batignol may have seemed an unlikely spot for France's wealthiest painter to build himself a house. The district was home, of course, to members of the so-called École de Batignol. It was also home to a large population of working-class Parisians, many of whom had been, like their neighbours in Montmartre, staunch supporters of the Commune. The women of the Batignol had been especially active, forming a women's union for the defence of Paris and raising barricades from the tops of which they flew the red flag. Still, the area was beginning to change. Messonnier had bought the land for his house from the brothers Emile and Isaac Perrier, wealthy railway developers and financiers who were hoping to transform this working-class neighbourhood into one of the most fashionable in Paris. He quickly set about planning a Renaissance-style chateau whose grandeur and opulence, it was to include a loggia, a courtyard and spiralling staircase, 
would put even the Grand Maison to shame. Besides his new home, Maisonnier was also busy with an old project, namely the seemingly interminable Friedland. By the spring of 1872, he had not touched the painting for more than 18 months. He had temporarily abandoned it during the siege of Paris, after which, with a house full of conquering Prussians, he had not had the heart to work on what he called this picture of victory. The man who had arranged to buy the work, Lord Hartford, had died of bladder cancer in August 1870. The work, therefore, had no owner until more than a year later, Sir Richard Wallace agreed to buy it. Supposedly Lord Hartford's illegitimate son, but more probably his illegitimate half-brother, Wallace inherited the Marquess's houses in London and Paris, his sprawling Irish estates, and his extraordinary art collection, which included among its treasures more than a dozen Maisonnier paintings. If Lord Hartford went to his grave with the consolation of knowing he had never rendered anyone a service, Wallace was determined to use his wealth more generously. Opportunities immediately presented themselves during the siege, and Monsieur Richard, as he was known to Parisians, rose heroically to the challenge. He funded two hospitals for the sick and wounded, provided food and coal for the poor, and in the end spent an estimated 2.5 million francs assisting the besieged and starving Parisians in one way or another. Wallace quickly demonstrated that he would be no less enthusiastic and Messiah collector than Lord Hartford. Early in 1872, he bought A Visit to the Burgomaster, Messonnier's first ever salon painting, and soon afterwards agreed to purchase freedom for 200,000 francs. This extravagant price matched the going rate for a work by the artist revered above all others in 19th century France. Since only a year later, the French government would spend 207,500 francs buying for the Louvre a fresco that Raphael had executed for La Maliana, the papal villa outside Rome. After paying Maisonnier an advance of 100,000 francs, Wallace shipped all 14 of his Maisonnier paintings across the Channel, together with most of the rest of his art collection, for an exhibition at the Bethnal Green Museum in London. This exhibition drew the usual complimentary reviews, one of the most enthusiastic came from the studiously elegant pen of a 29-year-old American named Henry James, whose first novel, Watch and Ward, had made its appearance a year earlier. The young novelist had picked his way through what he called an endless labyrinth of ever murkier and dingier alleys and slums, in order to describe the show for readers of the Atlantic Monthly. Among the paintings by Watteau, Rembrandt, Gainsborough and Vernet, he singled out Messonnier, for special praise. Messonnier's diminutive masterpieces, he wrote, form a brilliant group. They have, as usual, infinite finish, taste and research, and that inexorable certainty of hand and eye which probably has never been surpassed. That inexorable certainty would soon test the reaction of critics everywhere. Messonnier estimated that Friedland had been some six months from completion when the Franco-Prussian War erupted. Resuming work in the summer of 1872, he found his optimism had been well-founded. He would therefore be ready to unveil the painting in 1873, a full ten years after he first started work. Chapter 36. Pure Harlem Beer. Despite his grand studio and newfound success, in the autumn of 1872, Edward Manet could still be found warming a bench every evening in the artist's corner of the Café du Bois. By the early 1870s, the Café du Bois was crowded with, besides a regular group of painters, a motley band of dandies and bohemians. Included among them, until he absconded to Brussels with the 17-year-old Arthur Rimbaud, was Paul Verlaine, the absinthe addicted poet and former communard, an eccentric musician named Ernest Cabanet, who collected old boots to use as flower pots and lived on nothing but bread and milk, and the Comte de Villiers de Lille Adam, a penniless and dissolute poet and dramatist. But Manet was particularly taken with another of these fellow drinkers, a red-faced, beer-drinking, pipe-smoking engraver named Emile Bellot. I must do your portrait sometime, Manet had often told Bellot, and in the autumn of 1872, the engraver finally agreed to visit the Rue de saint Petersburg. Manet's inspiration for this portrait was almost certainly a visit he and Suzanne had made to Holland the previous June, immediately before he took possession of his new studio. 
It was Manet's first visit to Holland since his marriage in 1863, and while he may have had little desire to visit his in-laws, his enthusiasm for Dutch museums made the journey worthwhile. Accompanied by his brother-in-law, Ferdinand Lehnhoff, he had made a visit to the Franz Haas Museum in Harlem, a town of canals and gabled houses that was famous for growing flower bulbs and brewing beer. Opened ten years earlier in a former home for indigents, where the painter had died in 1666, the museum held more than a dozen of Harlem's portraits of worthy Harlem burghers dressed in Milston collars and dark suits. Yet besides these respectable Dutch merchants, Harles had also painted more light-hearted portraits of bosomy wenches and cheery, round-faced cavaliers. One of the best of these, the Merry Drinker, was in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, which Manet likewise visited. Painted in the 1620s, the work showed a rosy-cheeked gentleman in a rough collar and wide-brimmed hat, gesticulating amiably with his right hand and raising a glass of Harlem's finest with his left. This convivial bonhomme seems to put Manet in mind of his friend, Bellot, and within a few weeks of returning to Paris, he began work on a harles like painting called Le Bon Bach, The Good Pint. The honour opposing to Manet was, as ever, greater than the pleasure, and Bellot was obliged to visit the studio on at least 80 occasions. In keeping with the lordly style of his new studio, Manet instructed the concierge to admit Bellot, humiliatingly for the engraver, through the tradesman's entrance. At least the pose was by no means a demanding one, Bellow was merely required to don an otter skin cap and sit at a table holding a glass of beer while puffing happily on his long stemmed pipe. His twinkly eyed contentment is wonderfully captured, a rare example of Manet depicting animation and emotion in a subject. Manet himself was evidently pleased with the work, which he decided to send to the 1873 Salon. Manet was also working on several other paintings in between his relentless sessions with Bellow. One of them, quite different in flavour from the Bon Bock, was entitled The Railway, a portrait of a mother and child that included in the background the tracks and platforms of the Gare saint Bazaar, as seen from the back garden of the house in the Rue de Rue. The garden, which belonged to an artist friend, looked east across the tracks towards Manet's new studio, one of whose balustraded windows makes a sly cameo in the top left-hand corner of the painting. The work satisfied Couture's old demand for paintings of La Vie Moderne, since it featured huge clouds of locomotive steam rising above the railway cutting and the Pont de l'Europe, a star-shaped bridge with iron latticework that had been completed only in 1868. Manet seated the fashionably attired young mother on a concrete ledge, holding in her lap a clasped fan, an open book and a sleeping puppy. The child stands beside her, back turned as she clutches the iron railings at the foot of Hirsch's garden and looks down into the vaporous void of the railway station. The little girl was posed by his friend's daughter, and the young woman, surprisingly perhaps for such an image of bourgeois motherhood, by none other than Victorine Laurent. Victorine had only recently returned to Paris after six or seven years in America, to which she had emigrated to pursue a love affair. She may have been surprised at the pose she was ordered to adopt in Hirsch's garden, since its most notorious femme fatale of the 1860s salons suddenly found herself playing a maternal role. Even so, the painting would have been unsettling for anyone expecting an intelligible narrative or an unambiguous moral imperative. Victorine's nonchalant expression, the child turning her back, the prison-like bars of the railing, the smoking chasm of the railway tracks, the inexplicable bunch of grapes in the right foreground, as so often whenever Manet and Victorine came together, Numerous enigmatic touches seemed deliberately to frustrate any clear reading of the work. Louis Napoleon's exile in England had been a relatively pleasant one. Camden Place, his rented mansion in Chislehurst, was staffed by 50 servants and a host of numerous visitors. Both the Prince of Wales and Queen Victoria had come to pay their respects. The former then invited Louis Napoleon to his club in London, the latter by private train to Windsor Castle. The deposed emperor gratefully accepted both offers. He also made excursions to the Brighton Aquarium. And in the summer of 1871, he had holiday on the Isle of Wight, where he went yachting with a party that included a young American, Jenny Jerome, who three years later would become the mother of Sir Winston Churchill. Oh, wow. He even began working on a new invention, a cylindrical stove that would provide, he hoped, a cheap source of central heating for the poor. In addition to these recreations, 
Louis Napoleon had been, despite his protestations to the contrary, plotting his return to France. In a repeat of his exploits of three decades earlier, he planned to cross into France from Switzerland. He would then mobilise loyal elements in the army and march triumphantly on Versailles to overthrow Adolphe Thiers. His scheme was compromised, however, by the fact that he was too debilitated to ride a horse. Jenny Jerome had found him old, ill and sad, and indeed he was still suffering from both rheumatism and his bladder stone. Throughout the autumn of 1872, the pain from the stone became so excruciating that his physician, Sir Henry Thompson, decided to risk an operation. A thorough examination was conducted on Christmas Eve, followed by a crushing operation soon afterwards. Over the next week, two further operations were performed to break up the remains of what turned out to be the largest bladder stone Sir Henry had ever seen. A fourth procedure was scheduled, but Louis Napoleon's condition had begun rapidly to deteriorate. He died on the morning of the 9th of January, 1873, three months short of his 65th birthday. The Emperor's body lay in state, ironically for a man who had little appreciation for art, in the picture gallery on the ground floor of Camden Place. With the funeral taking place at St Mary's Catholic Church in Chiverhall, the tiny building had seating for fewer than 200 people, but some 30,000 more gathered in the grounds outside. The majority were French, hundreds of immortelles were sold, and mourners clipped sprigs from the yew and holly trees for souvenirs. There was weeping and sobbing from men as well as women, reported the Illustrated London News, which declared, the late emperor was a great man and a great ruler of men. In France, the newspapers expressed far less sympathetic opinions. Though Bonapartist organs such as L'Ordre announced the death on front pages boarded in black, the left-wing journals were jubilant. Requiscat and Pache in the oblivion of history sneered one, while another suggested that 200,000 Frenchmen would be alive and 5 billion francs saved if only Louis Napoleon had died a few years earlier. Meanwhile, the official government newspaper, Le Journal Officiel, did not bother to report the death until two days later, and then it deemed the emperor worthy of only a single line. Napoleon III died on the 9th of January at Chislehurst. Determined that her husband should not rest in the oblivion of history, Eugenie immediately began constructing a memorial for Louis Napoleon. No sooner was he interred in the sacristy of St Mary's than she commissioned a neo-Gothic chapel to enshrine his tomb, the granite for which had been donated by Queen Victoria. The small chapel attached to St Mary's would be completed early in 1874, in time for a requiem mass on the first anniversary of his death. Above its door was a stained glass window that featured, among other scenes, a portrait of St John the Evangelist holding a poison chalice. The image was an apt one for a man whose long reign had been brimful of both splendour and tragedy. A few days after the newspapers announced Louis Napoleon's death, Charles Blanc published the regulations for the 1873 Salon. He demanded such stringent qualifications from the voters that only 149 painters were eligible to receive a ballot, compared with more than 1,000 in 1870. As a result, jurors for the 1873 Salon turned out to be virtually identical to those elected the previous year. However, one member of the 1872 jury was conspicuously absent in 1873. The voters emphatically rejected Ernest Massonnier, denying him a place in the jury as a chastisement for his persecution of Gustave Courbet. The exclusion of Massonnier itself then caused a rumpus since several jurors, including Baudry and Breton, promptly resigned in a show of support. Though the rest of the artistic community seems to have endorsed the punishment of the belligerent and overbearing Messonnier. Messonnier was not especially troubled by his reproof from the voters because in 1873 he was involved in what he regarded as a grand omission. Almost six years had passed since Napoleon III opened the Universal Exposition in 1867. A number of large industrial exhibitions had been held since then, though nothing on the same scale as the Emperor's spectacular display in Paris. In 1870, however, the Lower Austrian Trade Association had proposed the staging of what became known as a Welthausstellung, or World Exhibition. A showcase, explained the organisers, that would embrace every field on which human intellect has been at work. A huge exhibition hall named the Rotunda, complete with a 440-foot wide dome, began rising over Prater Park in Vienna, while nearby a 2,000-foot-long machinery hall started taking shape. To the east of the Rotunda, beside the Danube, was the Fine Arts Gallery, 
a 600 foot long brick and stucco construction in which the most recent masterpieces of world art were due to be shown when the Emperor Franz Joseph opened the exhibition on the 1st of May, 1873. It was in this building, on the largest stage the world could provide, that Meissonier planned to unveil Friedland. Meissonier may have been persona non grata among many of his fellow artists in France, but abroad his name still carried enough weight and prestige that Charles Blanc chose him to head the international jury for the fine arts in which capacity he would oversee the display of French paintings in Vienna. Meissonier naturally took this task with relish, seeing a chance to demonstrate to the world, and in a German-speaking nation, that the genius of France was still alive and well. The critic, Edmund Abou, summed up the aspirations of many Frenchmen when he wrote that a French masterpiece exploding amid the mediocrity of arts in Europe would do us as much honour as a victory on the battlefield. To that end, Meissonier planned to send to Vienna masterworks of French painting from the Louvre, the Luxembourg, and other French museums. Besides the mighty Friedland, Meissonier also planned to dispatch some nine or ten others of his works. This artistic expedition soon encountered problems when Adolf Thiers, citing possible damage on route to Vienna, refused to allow any paintings to be removed from the walls of French museums. Meissonier was furious at his friend's casual attitude to the exhibition, which recalled the ineptness and complacency with which the French generals had prosecuted the war against the Prussians. He sent a telegram to Thiers, requesting an audience. We had a long conversation, Messonnier later reported. I told him over and over again that he was sending us out to battle with only half our arms, the best of which he was keeping back in the arsenal. Thiers eventually relented. The French would go into battle, fully equipped with masterpieces. So long as Messonnier was in charge, one artist would have nothing to do with the French expeditionary force. Over the past two decades, Gustave Courbet's work had been shown in London, Brussels, Amsterdam, Antwerp and Ghent, and even as far afield as New York and Boston. Courbet was especially popular among his Teutonic neighbours. He had spent several happy months in Frankfurt at the end of 1858 doing a lucrative trade in portraits, and in 1869 he had spent a few weeks painting and socialising in Munich where King Ludwig of Bavaria made him a Knight of the Order of St. Michael. He was therefore a natural choice to represent France in Vienna, but Meissonnier would have none of it. Not only was he impenitent about having excluded Courbet from the 1872 Salon, in 1873 he began pressing to have him banned from the World Exhibition as well. Vainglorious and self-centred as always, he seems not to have appreciated just how swiftly he was becoming more unpopular than the man who was persecuting. The jury for the 1873 Salon followed a predictable pattern, rejecting more than half of the 5,000 submissions. This harsh treatment was followed in turn by the usual response from the rejected artists, who began agitating for a Salon de refusé. For once, Charles Blanc acceded to their wishes, making provisions for what was named an Exposition Artistique des Ouvres Refusés. The works of hundreds of rejected artists would therefore go on show on the 10th anniversary of the infamous Salon de Refusé of 1863. Courbet had submitted nothing for the 1873 Salon because he feared, with good reason, that the authorities might seize his canvases from the Palais de Champs Elysees. At his 1871 trial in Versailles, he had stated, much to his subsequent regret, that he would pay for the rebuilding of the Vendôme Column and, by 1873, the government was ready to hold him to his word. In January, his friend Castagnari warned him to get as many of his canvases as possible out of France, lest they fall into the hands of the authorities. Though Courbet claimed his notoriety guaranteed even higher prices for his work, by this time much of his bravado had been replaced by worry and grief. I am in a state of inexpressible anxiety, he wrote to his sister Lydie. His 14-year-old son, by a former mistress, had died in the summer of 1872, and he himself was once again in poor health, with rheumatism and an enlarged liver. Though this latter ailment did not prevent him from buying a 40-gallon cask of burned wine, with which to celebrate a particularly lucrative sale. Claude Monet was also absent from the Palais de Champs-Élysées. After returning from London, he had moved with Camille to Argentoy, a picturesque town directly across the Seine from Genevilliers. Here, sails could be seen scudding along the river and chimney stacks puffing their clouds of smoke into the sky, all of which Monet painted over and over again. 
He had finished nearly 60 canvases in 1872, 38 of which he found himself able to sell, fetching a total of 12,000 francs and putting his income for 1872 on par with doctors and lawyers. Gone were the days when he could no longer afford a fire for his kitchen. With these sales to his credit, he did not require exposure at the salon, and so in 1873 he once again declined the humiliating ritual of sending work before the jury. Most other members of the Batignol group likewise abstained. More significantly, Pizarro, who had sold a number of his canvases to Paul de Manuel, was setting in motion plans for an alternative exhibition that would bypass the salon jury altogether. He had already been recruiting potential exhibitors in the autumn of 1872. A painter friend named Ludovic Piet, a former pupil of Couture, summed up the sentiments of many fellow artists when he wrote to Pizarro in December, if a certain nucleus of painters plans not to exhibit at all in the Salon of 1873, above all, if Courbet is excluded, and if the jury is still composed of reactionaries or Bonapartists, I would also join with pleasure. However, one notable actualist did appear at the 1873 Salon, as he had the previous year. Both of Manet's submissions, Le Bon Bock and The Repose, his 1868 portrait of Bert Morisseau, were accepted by the jury of reactionaries, Ten years after the original Salon des Refusés, Manet would be the only member of the generation of 1863 still flying the flag in the Palais de Champs-Élysées. The annual Salon has been opened, an English correspondent reported from Paris in the first week of May, with a somewhat disappointing result. Very few out of the 1,500 pictures exhibited call for any special notice. As in 1872, the critics were distinctly underwhelmed with the English reviewer registering his disappointment that nothing by Ernest Messonnier was on show, a fact much commented upon. So many pieces of soft focus eroticism hung on the walls that another English reviewer, the correspondent for the Times, observed disapprovingly that each room included from six to eight examples of staring nudity. Landscapes by Corot and Daubigny were also present, the latter taking a merciless critical drubbing for the supposedly sketchy and unfinished look of his effect of snow. When the reviews of the repose appeared in the papers, Bert Morisseau found herself stepping into Victorine's role as the most ridiculed and reviled woman in the salon, as the canvas received abuse all too familiar to Manet. The portrait was denounced as a horror. It was dubbed seasickness and the woman who squints. It was lampooned as a portrait of a woman resting after having swept the chimney and it was said to depict the goddess of slovenliness. A critic in the Revue des Deux Mondes summed up the portrait by declaring it a confusion defying all description. These insults, together with the fact that her own works had been rejected by the jury, seems to have convinced Morisseau that her future lay not in the salon, but with the nucleus of painters taking shape around Pizarro. Nonetheless, in 1873, Manet was in for an even bigger triumph than he had enjoyed with the Battle of the USS Kearsarge, and the CSS Alabama a year earlier. Sending a painting of a drinker to the salon may have looked unwise in 1873, given how alcoholism and working-class insurgency had become virtually synonymous in the public mind since the end of the commune. The term alcoholism had been coined as a diagnosis as recently as 1865, and the French Temperance Society was founded immediately after the suppression of the commune, with a view to battling this perceived problem. One thought by many to have explained not only the outrages of the Commune, but also the French defeat by the Prussians. However, the public and the critics saw no indication of working-class dissent in Emile Bellot's contented beer drinker, and Le Bon Bock quickly became the most popular painting in the entire salon. Praise flowed from all quarters. The front page of Le Soir declared the painting a marvel of life and colour, amazing and excellent. Le Gaulois called it an indisputable success announcing that Manet has found a curious and interesting style, and the public will follow his new efforts with pleasure. Even critics normally hostile to Manet found themselves charmed by the work. This supposed demon, come forth from the pit to frighten women and children, is in fact an interesting painter, wrote Paul Mats in Leton, and a peaceful and distinguished man. Like many spectators, he saw something soothingly nostalgic in the work, which seemed to feature a sturdy Frenchman, blissfully unruffled by the multiple horrors of the previous few years. In our present troubled times, wrote Mans, this placid drinker symbolises eternal serenity. 
his rosy cheeks and portly frame say so well that he knows no sadness. Even Albert Wolfe was able to find words for approval, avouching that Manet has put water in his beer. He has renounced his violent and outlandish effects to explore a more pleasing harmony. Water, quipped Manet's friend Alfred Stevens after reading the review. It's pure Harlem beer. Stevens was correct. The way for Manet's merry drinker had been paved by Franz Hals and the generation of Harlem painters who followed him. Men who did quaint and humorous scenes of slosh, stuprous peasants. But someone else besides Manet had been inspired by this genre and paved the way for the success of Le Bon Bois. Even before his visit to Holland in 1850, Ernest Messonnier had been busily conjuring to life his own little pipe smokers and beer drinkers. He exhibited a work called A Smoker at the 1842 Salon, A Man Smoking in 1849, and in 1854 he painted A Smoker in Black, a portrait of a young man puffing on a long-stemmed pipe in the corner of the tavern, a glass of beer at his elbow. Messonnier's exalted reputation had been built precisely on this sort of scene, and the congenial reception accorded Le Bon Bob no doubt had much to do, ironically, with the taste for Bibilius Bonhomme, formed by Messonnier a quarter of a century earlier. Le Bon Bob gave Manet an unaccustomed celebrity. His fame increased as a newspaper reported in the middle of June that an offer of 120,000 francs had been made for the painting, an incredible sum that Messonnier alone could command. Alas for Manet, the report proved to be a typographical error. Two weeks later, the paper described how Manet had come to the newspaper's offices, demanding to know the name of the man offering 120,000 francs. The report, admitted the sheepish editor, should have read 12,000. In the end, the painting would be sold for a more modest sum of 6,000 francs, though this price was nevertheless double that paid by de Renouel for any of Manet's previous works. The buyer was a famous baritone named Jean-Baptiste Fleur, a professor of singing at the Paris Conservatoire and a well-known connoisseur of painting. The impact of Manet's painting was nothing short of sensational. You're as famous as Garibaldi, Degas told Manet that summer, surveying the astonishing success of the painting. Its fame radiated outward from the Palais de Champs-Élysées as Paris was swept by a bon bot craze. Reproductions of the painting went on sale in bookshops and tobacconists. A shopkeeper in the Rue Vivienne, beside the Bourse, displayed in his window what he claimed was Manet's palette, beside which he placed a mug of beer. And a restaurant in the Latin Quarter, in a clever bid to increase its custom, changed its name to Le Bon Boc. But the greatest beneficiary of this fame, besides Manet, was Emile Bellot, who reveled in his own newfound celebrity and developed a reputation as a connoisseur of beer. Two years later, he would capitalize on his reputation by founding the Bon Bock Society, a social club for artists and intellectuals that hosted boozy, boisterous dinners each month in Montmartre. Active for almost 50 years, the society would do much to make Montmartre, before then a suburb known for windmills and working-class radicalism, into a center of Parisian cultural life. Manet was finally enjoying the popular, critical and financial success that had eluded him for so long. But have the public and the critics matured in the years since Le Déjeuner sur l'Herbe and Olympia, or had Manet changed his style? Only three years earlier, Gautier had written that Manet was determined to die impenitent, but suddenly the troublingly provocative pictures had given way to a cuddly bonhomme in an otter-skin cap, deemed fit to adorn shop windows and tavern signs, to sell beer and tobacco, to be calm and amuse a tormented nation. Accused in 1863 of terrorizing the bourgeoisie, a decade later, Manet appeared to be enchanting them in the style of Messonnier or Jerome. Yet one critic in particular could appreciate Le Bon Bock for something other than the jolly charms of Emile Bellot. A discerning 24-year-old reviewer named Marie-Amélie de Montfort, who wrote under the masculine pseudonym Marc de Montfort, a budding novelist, historian, feminist and art critic, Montefort had just published her first book, The History of Eloise and Ebelard, and her study of the poetry of Anatole France was forthcoming in October. In 1873, she reviewed the salon for L'Artiste, and her comments on Le Bon Bob were almost singular in their perspicacity. While most people admired the painting for its content, she concentrated on its technique, Manet's loose brushwork and broad patches of pigment, maligned by so many critics, 
were actually an attempt, Montefort recognised, to use shape and colour to compose an entirely new visual experience by means of a kind of optical fusion. One perceives at first glance in his bonbon, bon, she wrote, coloured areas laid one next to the other with a crude simplicity and without any shading. But stand back a little. Relations between masses of colour begin to be established. Each part falls into place and each detail becomes exact. A more acute insight into the aesthetic effects of the Accord de Latignon had never been produced. Chapter 37. Beyond Perfection. The Universal Exhibition of Arts and Industry in Vienna was not a disaster, but neither did it bear comparison to the Great Exhibition in London in 1851 or the Universal Exposition in Paris in 1867. The enormous rotunda and its adjoining galleries had been finished on time, provided almost 20 acres of exhibition space. Amazingly, some four times as much as had been available in Paris. But many displays were not actually in place by the middle of June, let alone for the grand opening in May. A few days after the opening of the 9th of May, the Vienna stock market collapsed in what became known as Der Krach. And to cap it all, the weather was atrocious. The grand opening took place amid chilly showers and the ankle-deep quagmires of mud in Prater Park were succeeded by dust storms as downpours throughout May turned to a stifling heat in June. The adverse conditions kept the visitors away, as did the high prices charged by Vienna's innkeepers, who greedily doubled their rates. Then, in July, a cholera outbreak was reported. The exhibition's director-general, Baron Wilhelm von schwarz senborn eventually slashed the admission charge in half. The Vienna exhibition was therefore a less than perfect form for the French to restore their international reputation and for Ernest Massonnier to unveil Friedland. Still, France's display was widely regarded as by far the most impressive in the entire exhibition. The French had been given more than 6,000 square metres of exhibition space, or almost an acre and a half, second only to the Germans, and their galleries were filled with elegant attractions such as Aubusson and Gobelin tapestries, fans by Dubois silks from Lyon, and such crowd pleasers as photographs by Nadal and a Bible illustrated by Gustave Doré. France has reason to feel satisfied with the results of her efforts, wrote an English correspondent, for her display at Vienna is a surprise even to those acquainted with the energy of her people and the resources of the country. The standard of their goods was so high that incredibly the French were awarded a quarter of all the prizes easily eclipsing those of any other country, Germany included. The French truly excelled themselves, however, in the fine arts gallery. Housing some 6,500 works of art, this building was opened by the Emperor Franz Joseph on the 15th of May in a ceremony performed beneath Alexander Cabanel's The Triumph of Flora, an oval-shaped mythological scene finished a short while earlier. Painters and sculptors from 26 countries had sent works of art to Vienna, but the French, with 1,527 pieces on display, comprised a quarter of the entire exhibition. Eight rooms in the gallery, as well as half the central hall, were dedicated to the finest examples of French art. Sculptures by Jean-Baptiste Capot, canvases by André, Delacroix, and Théodore Rousseau. The effect was overwhelming. Most critics and spectators were agreed that the French outclassed the opposition in quality as well as quantity. France, one English critic proclaimed, carries off the palm. Another made a welcome comparison between the French and the Germans, praising the fidelity to nature shown by the former and castigating the harsh colouring and severe drawing of the latter. Even an Italian visitor, the architect Camilo Boito, grudgingly admitted that the French were ever so far ahead in the disciplines of beauty. The greatest interest, though, was reserved for Messonnier, who had dispatched nine of his own paintings into this artistic combat, none of which, except the end of the gambling quarrel, had ever been seen in public. In addition to a couple of musketeer scenes, he also chose three of his antique landscapes, one a watercolour, providing visitors to the Fine Arts Gallery with a glimpse of possibly unexpected versatility in dealing with colour and light. They were predictably well received, with the critic of the Times exclaiming over the beauties of these light saturated landscapes. But watercolours and musketeers, nonetheless, made odd choices for a man obsessed with artistic grandeur, as well as with the moral and patriotic regeneration of France. 
In 1871, Messonnier had claimed the aftermath of the war against Prussia was no time to paint little figures. And yet, try as he might to drive his repertoire into Olympian realms, he could never quite abandon his musketeers. Absent from the fine arts gallery were Massonnier's two patriotic allegories from 1871, the siege of Paris and the ruins of the Tuileries. He likely left these two works back in Poissy to avoid stirring up memories of the shameful and tragic episodes in the Franco-Prussian War and the Commune. The failure of painters at the 1872 Salon to pull artistic victories from the jaws of military defeats no doubt convinced him to dwell instead on an incontestable triumph. And for that reason, his hopes in Vienna rode on another work. This, of course, was the masterpiece calculated to explode amid the mediocrity of arts in Europe, with all the devastating force of a battlefield victory. On the 15th of May, 1873, following a short speech by the Emperor Franz Joseph, the world therefore got its first glimpse of Friedland. Few works in the history of art have consumed as much labour, generated so much rumour and anticipation, been showered with as much money, or simply taken so long to complete as Messonnier's Friedland. The canvas had been the product of exhaustive studies and researches, bizarre experiments, real-life cavalry charges, and as many as a hundred separate studies of everything from the crook of a soldier's arm to the joint of a horse's foreshortened leg. It had survived the skewering from a fencing saw, bombardment by the Prussians, and the flames of bloody weak. In the ten years he spent on this work, Messonnier had metamorphosed from a painter whose election to the Institut de France had been celebrated by progressive newspapers as a victory for youth over the old academy to a painter reviled by those same progressive newspapers as an appalling reactionary. He had turned from an artist known for exquisite little paintings of musketeers and other bonhommes into a man possessed by Michelangelo's visions of covering the pantheon with sprawling murals of appealing to posterity from a hundred foot walls. And his opponents finally had changed from the diehards found in the Académie des Beaux-Arts to the younger generation of artists who gathered at the Café Gourbois. Despite his incredible hauteur and colossal self-regard, even Massonnet must have wondered how long he could possibly keep his grasp on the vertiginous summit to which he had climbed. For the previous two decades, he had been celebrated as the incontestable master who would be venerated, according to Delacroix, long after his contemporaries disappeared into the shades. Yet he knew from his historical studies, as well as from witnessing the collapse of the Second Empire, that power, fame and glory were the most transient of properties. One of his favourite stories concerned a comment made by Napoleon while at the height of his powers. The emperor had gathered with several close friends at the Chateau de Malmaison when talk turned to the blazing glory of his reign. Yes, Napoleon soberly told his listeners, but some day I shall see the abyss open before me and I shall not be able to stop myself. I shall climb so high that I shall turn giddy. The year 1873 was not perhaps the best time to unveil a work such as Friedland, the historic victory on Prussian soil, commemorated by the painting, was made to look somewhat hollow by the Germans' gleaming display, only a few yards from the fine arts gallery of the giant crook cannons that had shredded the modern-day French cuirassiers with such brutal efficiency. Equally inauspicious was the work's celebration of Napoleon. Ten years earlier, as Messonnier set to work on his masterpiece, Adolf Thiers wrote that Napoleon was the man who has inspired France with the strongest emotions she has ever felt. But by 1873, these emotions were not so strong. The cult of Napoleon, so lustrous and potent throughout the 1860s, had been damaged with the fall of Napoleon III and the transition of France from an imperial power to a republic constituted in the ignominy of military defeat and civil war. Indeed, the Bonapartes were derided in one Republican newspaper following the death of Louis-Napoleon as that sinister and cursed race. Rather than trumpeting the glories of France, Messonnier appeared to have created an elegy for a lost empire and a testimonial to fugitive and meretricious grandeur. Friedland was prominently displayed in the central hall of the Fine Arts Gallery. It was an arresting sight, a full pelt cavalry charge magically frozen in time every bunched muscle and flying hoof, every stalk of ripening wheat, captured with a precision that no photographer and no other painter could hope to replicate. Not even the campaign of France, Messonnier's masterclass in heaving human and equine bodies into motion, 
could have prepared viewers for the thundering gallop across the canvas of the triumphant cuirassiers. The composition was a thrilling one, plunging spectators headlong into the scene. Here, for the first time on a broad canvas, were all the extraordinary virtuosities with which Messonnier had made his name. The trademark dexterities of brush, the microscopically precise details, the rigorously anatomical and exquisitely choreographed movements of horses and riders. The painting repaid the closest inspection, yielding up such infinitesimal details as the bulging veins on the legs of Napoleon's white charger and the poppies a few dashes of red crushed beneath the hooves of the stampeding cuirassiers. For anyone who knew to look for it, there was also evidence of Charles Messonnier's mishap with the fencing saw, since the flank of the sorrel horse in the middle foreground betrayed both an ever so slight wrinkling of the canvas and a thick and apparently clumsy application of paint, altogether unlike Messonnier's usual elegant brushwork. Most viewers were enthralled by the astonishing level of detail, with critics exclaiming over Messonnier's scrupulous exactitude, his conscientiousness, and the unparalleled means by which he gave a vivid impression of nature seized from life. The critic for the Times wrote that the composition is remarkably bold and the execution at once vigorous and minute. A Viennese paper, the Tageblatt, proclaimed him the ace of spades in French art and called his paintings a constellation of stars in the fine arts gallery. Meanwhile, a French critic writing in the Journal Officiel noted with satisfaction that his glory was still without eclipse. And yet not everyone was convinced by the painting. A few years later, Messonnier would complain about the many, among the thousands of viewers, who have done it injustice with a certain malevolent appreciation. He was exaggerating, though a minority of critics did take the view that the whole of freedom was something less than the sum of its parts. One of the most trenchant was Arsène Housset's son, Henri, a masterful young art critic and classical historian, who reviewed the painting for the Revue des Deux Mondes. His argument was one Messonnier must have found damaging for the simple reason that it was undeniably and embarrassingly accurate. Messonnier believed the painter's task was to come to the aid of history, once claiming that had he not become a painter, he would have been an historian like Adolf Thiers. He purported to be a student of Thiers in matters Napoleonic, keeping beside his bed volumes of the history of the consulate and the empire of France under Napoleon and on occasion inviting Thiers to Poissy to discuss the finer points of French military history. With Friedland, Messonnier had hoped to achieve a perfect historical reconstruction by translating onto canvas what Thiers had put onto the page. Housset, however, uncovered a troublesome lapse in Messonnier's historical appreciation, one suggesting that Friedland was actually a fiction. A keen scholar of Napoleon, Housset would later publish a two-volume history of the First Empire that ran through 46 editions. He knew whereof he spoke, therefore, when he pointed out that the episode betrayed Napoleon reviewing his charging cuirassiers had never actually occurred. The 3,500 Grove Frere had made their dramatic assault against the enemy columns long before Napoleon made his appearance on the battlefield at Friedland. Housset then went on to explicate the farcical nature of the composition by pointing out how the particular trajectory of the charge, which sent the cuirassiers looping round to the Emperor's right, invited spectators logically to conclude that either Napoleon had turned his back on the enemy or the cuirassiers were in the process of fleeing from battle. Messonnier was thereby exposed as someone defective in both historical knowledge and military tactics, devastating assaults on a man who prided himself on his absolute fidelity to history. Poussey also voiced what was ultimately, perhaps, an even more serious criticism one that further struck at the root of Messonnier's artistic project. Specifically, he felt Messonnier had gone overboard in his laborious attempts to represent the movement and musculature of his horses. The work's mind-boggling complexity of detail, far from husband the realism, actually detracted from it. Messonnier's fixation on anatomical exactitude merely resulted in horses that looked like they had been flayed of their skin. He wanted to go beyond perfection, what you say, to show everything, to not let a single muscle relax, nor hide a single vein beneath the skin. He argued, in effect, that Massonnier failed to see the forest for the trees. Though his horses were anatomically correct in every last detail, they were not actually true to life. A galloping horse, he pointed out, 
cannot be painted with the minute meticulousness and patience that one employs for a figure of rest. Such figures must be executed with vigorous touches, otherwise they will be frozen and immobilized in their movement. Maisonnier's all-engrossing scrutiny of his subject, combined with his almost mesmeric style of delineating the result, ultimately made for a dubious and unrealistic scene. The canvas was zoatomically impeccable, but for spectators such as Husset, visually unconvincing. What Messonnier saw as he watched anatomical dissection or rode alongside Conan du Poissois's galloping cuirassiers did not tally with the blurry or indistinct impressions of equine locomotion gained, for example, by a spectator's position beside the finishing post at Longchamp. Messonnier's attempts to press technological advances into the service of art had produced animals that belonged less in the École des Beaux-Arts than in the École Nationale Veterinaire. Someone considerably more important to Messonnier than Henri Husset likewise entertained reservations about the painting. Among the hundreds of notable visitors to the International Exhibition in Vienna was Sir Richard Wallace, who made his way to the Fine Arts Gallery in a distinguished company that featured the Prince of Wales and several English politicians. Also in the party were the critic Charlie Yarp and the art dealer Francis Petit, both close friends of Messonnier. Naturally, they went straight for Friedland. The Prince of Wales and his companions were suitably awed by the painting. At first sight, Yatt remembered, this admirable work drew a cry of admiration from our whole party. Petit then turned to the Prince of Wales, whose father, Prince Albert, had been such an enthusiast for Messonnier, and informed His Royal Highness that he could congratulate Sir Richard on being its fortunate owner. But, to the surprise of Yatt and the others, Sir Richard, who only a year earlier had parted with an advance of 100,000 francs, modestly declined the honour, an announcement that must have shocked Petit, who had personally arranged the sale. Friedland was suddenly, and somewhat inexplicably, without an owner, and Messonnier was without the promised second instalment of 100,000 francs. This unexpected renunciation of ownership had little to do with aesthetic disagreements of the sort advanced by Husay, and everything to do with a childish misunderstanding. Wallace had advanced Messonnier 100,000 francs for Friedland on the understanding that later the final conditions could be settled according to the work's importance. But these final conditions were never settled. By 1873, virtually all communication had lapsed between patron and painter as Wallace moved more or less permanently to London, having become, among other things, the Member of Parliament for Antrim in Ireland. According to Yarford, Wallace was somewhat offended by the artist's protracted silence, while Messonnier, for his part, was miffed that the connoisseur for whose collection the work was destined should never have displayed any curiosity about it. This standoff culminated with Wallace disowning Friedland in front of the Prince of Wales, oh, and Messonnier boy. obliged to return his advance of 100,000 francs. Despite favourable reviews and the admiring throngs, Messonnier was therefore left looking to his laurels as it became clear that the triumphs of 1855 and 1867 were not to be repeated in Vienna. As a student of history, he could have glimpsed the possibility of a grisly parallel between Napoleon's military endeavours and his own artistic career. In Messonnier's opinion, Napoleon's greatest triumph had been the Battle of Friedland, not simply because of the virtuoso tactics and crushing finality of the victory, but because prior to 1807, the emperor, as Messonnier wrote, made no mistakes. Perfection had followed perfection, but freedom was also, Messonnier believed, the beginning of the end, the setting of the course that would lead Napoleon inescapably into the abyss of Waterloo. Messonnier returned to Poissy in the summer of 1873, and in a gesture typical of the almost maniacal craftsman that he was, restored freedom to his easel. Despite his years of effort, the painting was still, in his opinion, something less than perfect, and it was perfection, he always claimed, that lured him forward.
Chapter 38. The Liberation of Paris. France had a new president by the time Messonnier returned from Vienna. Adolphe Thiers resigned on the 24th of May, 1873, following a no-confidence motion in the National Assembly, prompted by monarchist opposition to his appointment to the cabinet of three Republicans. A day later, the Assembly's conservative majority elected a man much more to their tastes, Marshal Patrice Macmont, the general who two years earlier had crushed the commune. In his inaugural address, delivered on the 26th of May, the 65-year-old Macmont stated that the aim of his government was the restoration of moral order in our country. A religious revival was already underway in France. Over the previous year, dozens of trainloads of pilgrims had travelled south to Lourdes, where in 1858, visions of the Virgin Mary had been revealed to a 14-year-old named Bernadette Soubirou, and the first national pilgrimage to Lourdes, complete with a torchlight procession, was planned for the 21st of July, 1873. The Virgin Mary and Joan of Arc had been appearing to young women throughout the country, while the sculptor, Emmanuel Fermier, was working on a bronze equestrian statue of St. Joan, clad in armour and holding a standard, that was destined for the Place de Pyrénées. In keeping with this moral order, Macmillan's administration launched plans for a number of large architectural projects. A new church, the Basilica of Sacré-Cœur, would be built in Montmartre, on the spot where Generals Lecomte and Clément Thomas had been executed. Funded by public subscription, it would serve, as the deputies and National Assembly affirmed, as witness of repentance and as a symbol of hope. The government also announced plans to rebuild the Vendôme Column, this latter project, expected to cost hundreds of thousands of francs, will be funded not by public subscription, but rather, very much against his wishes, by Gustave Courbet. To that end, the government ordered the sequestration of his property in both Paris and Ormont, at which point Courbet fled into exile in Switzerland. Here, according to a friend, he began drowning himself in white wine. The government of moral order also had plans for yet another grand artistic project, Charles Blanc was dismissed as Director of Fine Arts in December 1873, a victim, according to Le Ton, of malice and political prejudice. His crime, the newspaper maintained, was to be a Republican, and the presence of a Republican at the head of Fine Arts was, it would seem, a scandal the government of the moral order could no longer support. His replacement was a man with irreproachable conservative credentials, the Marquis de Chenevière. Deprived of his responsibilities at the Salon early in 1870, Chenevier had spent the previous few years working as a curator at the Musée de Luxembourg and raging in the newspapers against socialism, atheism, and the evils of the commune. Returned to a position of power, he immediately set about commissioning artists to work on his pet project, the decoration of the Church of saint Genevieve, otherwise known as the Pantheon. saint Genevieve possessed a confusing history oscillated between the sacred and the profane. Commissioned in the 1750s by King Louis XV, it was raised on the site of a shrine dedicated to the patron saint of Paris, a nun who had averted an attack on the city by Attila the Hun. However, construction had not been completed until 1791, at which point the revolutionaries seized the church, incinerated the remains of saint Genevieve, and transformed the building into a secular temple, the Pantheon, under whose neoclassical dome the great men of France, such as Voltaire and Rousseau, could be buried. The building was reconsecrated as a church in 1821, only to be secularized again in 1831. It then reverted back to the Catholic Church in 1852, one year after the physicist Jean Bernard Léon Foucault suspended a 220 foot long pendulum from its dome in order to demonstrate the rotation of the earth on its axis. In 1871, the church was damaged by a shell during the Prussian bombardment. Two months later, the communards replaced the cross on its dome with the red flag, vandalized the remaining relics, and turned the building back into a temple. Though by 1873 it was known once more as the Church of saint Genevieve, Genevieve was anxious to imprint an indelibly and unmistakably Christian identity on the building in order to forestall any future attempts at secularization. Since Paul Genevard's proposed mural decorations begun in 1848 had come to nothing, Chenevier immediately ordered a series of religious murals for the church's walls and vaults. Painters involved in the project were Cabanel, Jerome, and Baudry, all experienced muralists. Also receiving a commission was Messonnier, 
who possessed no experience whatsoever in New York. He had become obsessed with New York's hair, to the point where, as his new mansion rose on the boulevard Malzil, he began fantasizing about covering its ceilings and walls with historical and allegorical scenes. Last night I could not sleep, he wrote, and I lay awake thinking of the paintings I would put on the walls of my house, over one door, painting and music, over the other, sculpture and architecture. Won't my staircase be magnificent with an allegory of the poet on one wall and Homer appearing to Dante on the other? Learning of the plans of saint Genevieve, Messonnier had approached Genevieve to let him know of his wish to participate. Genevieve later recalled how Messonnier's name was therefore put forward for consideration. I can assure you, he claimed, that no one began to laugh and no one thought of the size of his paintings. Messonnier thereby found himself, in the spring of 1874, engaged to decorate a 39-foot high wall on the left side of the high altar with a scene entitled The Liberation of Paris by Saint Genevieve. He was duly given a history lesson by the church's abbot, who recounted the tale of how a barge loaded with bread destined for starving Parisians besieged by the Huns was miraculously saved from destruction after Saint Genevieve waved her arm and turned a jagged rock in the middle of the Seine into a serpent. The story of Saint Genevieve and Attila the Hun had obvious resonances after the siege of Paris by the Prussians. All the more so given that General Trochu, the military governor of Paris during the siege, claimed Saint Genevieve had come to him in a vision offering to save the city once again. Messonnier was less than enthused, however, about the pictorial possibilities of the episode of the rock and the serpent. It really is impossible to get up any enthusiasm for such a theme. Mm -hmm. He was delighted even so at the prospect of decorating the wall of such an important building and of proving himself in the most prestigious of all painting techniques. Yet the commission did raise a few eyebrows. Genevieve and his colleagues may not have laughed, but not everyone was so restrained at the thought of the painter of Lilliput tacking such a grand design. Can one imagine a more absurd fantasy, scoffed Pierre Veron, editor of Le Chavaverie, who predicted a disastrous outcome? Mural painting presented enormous challenges to an artist, working on the surface of a high wall or curved vault, where the design needed to be incorporated into the architecture was a more complex and demanding operation than even the largest easel painting. More challenging still was a mastery of technique. Italian Renaissance masters such as Michelangelo had worked in a medium known as one fresco. The word fresco, meaning fresh, refers to the fact that the artist painted on a patch of wet plaster that was troweled onto the surface of the wall each day as he began work. The frescoist was forced to complete his scene, necessarily only a few feet square, in the eight or twelve hours in which this patch of plaster would dry. The technique had the advantage of durability, since the pigments would be, in effect, locked in stone once the plaster had dried. Yet it had the considerable disadvantage of requiring great speed and accuracy, since once the plaster dried, the painter was unable to make corrections to his work, short of chipping it off from the wall and starting again. For these reasons, Fresco was, according to one Italian Renaissance artist, the most manly, most certain, most resolute, most durable method of painting. Few 19th century mural painters worked in fresco, however. The exact technique, transmitted from master to pupil in Renaissance workshops, was no longer completely understood, especially outside Italy. When monumental frescoes were ordered in the 1840s for the embellishment of the rebuilt Houses of Parliament in London, the commissioners of the fine arts were obliged to send the painter, William Dice, to Italy to investigate the lost techniques of the old masters. Nor was the medium understood any better in France when Delacroix received a commission to decorate a room in the Palais Bourbon. He understood so little of fresco painting that he went to a former Benedictine abbey in Normandy and conducted a series of experiments on its walls. The upshot of his investigations was a method very different from that practiced by Michelangelo and Raphael, whose technique did away with the need for binders, such as oils, glues, or egg whites. Delacroix, in contrast, developed a procedure by which he suspended his pigments in melted wax before adding them to the dry masonry. Better suited than fresco to the damper, cooler French climate, this wax emulsion allowed him the luxury of revising and retouching the mural. Likewise, when Ingres worked on his mural The Golden Age at the Chateau de Dompierre in the 1840s, he mixed his pigments with oil, something his idol Raphael would never have done before adding them to dry plaster. 
A proud and superlative craftsman, Nassonia no doubt looked forward to the numerous manual and technical stages of mural painting. Like any 19th century muralist, however, he needed to experiment with techniques before going to work on his wall in saint Genevieve. He also needed to bring together a team of painters to help him prepare designs, and, when the time came, to assist him on the scaffold. Help was at hand, fortunately, as he conscripted into service both his son Charles and his pupil, Lucien Gros. He then set about making the first studies and drawings for the liberation of Paris. The elaborate preparations must have been daunting, even for the painter of Friedland, since murals require not only scores of compositional sketches, but also cartoons, full-scale drawings that served as the templates from which the final design was transferred to the wall. Murals were always, therefore, a labour of years. Angre had executed as many as 500 separate drawings for the Golden Age, which consumed six years of work. Delacroix had spent seven years on his murals in the church of Saint-Sulpice, while Baudry's 36 scenes for Garnier's new opera house were almost ten years in the making. Hundreds, even thousands of hours of work would therefore be required before the first brushstroke of paint could be added to the wall in saint jean de the 39-foot-high canvas across which Messonnier believed he would inscribe his magnificent legacy. At the end of December 1873, four days after the appointment of Chenevier as Director of Fine Arts, a group of artists banded together to launch a new artistic enterprise that would coincide almost exactly with the mural commission of the saint Genevieve. Courbet's exclusion from the 1872 Salon and his subsequent exile from France, as well as their prolonged disenchantment with the Salon system in general, had finally determined Camille Pizarro and his nucleus of painters to test their fortunes elsewhere. Despite the onset of the moral order, by the end of 1873, the signs were favourable for at least a few members of the Accord de Batignol. Edouard Manet sold paintings worth 22,000 francs in the months following his success at the 1873 Salon, while Claude Monet earned 24,800 francs from the sales of his paintings over the previous 12 months, doubled his income in 1872. These sales had been possible in part because in 1873 the French economy was in a remarkably rude health considering the events of the previous three years. In September 1873, the Germans who had been occupying 16 departments finally left the country. Showing remarkable resilience, the French had discharged the entire 5 billion franc indemnity in a little more than two years. These reparations have been paid so promptly here. thanks yep. largely to the profits from the booming wine industry. Since Louis Pasteur had discovered that pasteurizing wine briefly heating it to 55 degrees Celsius to kill off the microscopic organisms, made it last longer and travel better. The result was an increase in exports to countries such as Britain and America. French art, as well as French wine, looked like it was beginning to travel well. Paul durand had published a catalogue of his collection and in the first week of November opened in his London gallery an exhibition of what one English newspaper called the latest phases of Parisian fashion in art. Among them were canvases by Pizarro, Monet, Domeny, Courbet, and Whistler. The relative success of this exhibition was followed by the formation at the end of December of a cooperative venture called the Joint Stock Company of Artists, Painters, Sculptors, Engravers, and Lithographers. The company's charter, composed by Pizarro, was based on that of a baker's organization in Pontoise, while the aim of the members, according to an article in Le Chronique des Arts, was the organization of free exhibitions without a jury or honorific awards, the sale of the works in question, and the publication as soon as possible of a newspaper devoted to the arts. The Society's first step would be the staging of an independent exhibition or what quickly became known as the Realist Salon. It was scheduled to open in April 1874, two weeks before the official salon. Besides Pizarro, members of this cooperative society included Monet, Renoir, Degas, Cézanne, and Morisseau. The membership did not, however, despite various overtures, include Manet. The success of Le Bon Bon had convinced him that he was on the verge of making his reputation in the official salon. His letters at this time were even inscribed on notepaper, headed with a jauntily optimistic slogan, Tout arrive, everything arrives. Okay. An equally compelling reason for his refusal to join the realist salon was his low opinion of much of the work produced by its prospective exhibitors. Though he was fond of Renoir, 
he even owned one of his works, he was not especially impressed by the younger man's paintings. He regarded him, a mutual friend later claimed, as a decent sort of chap who had taken up painting by mistake. Much worse, he believed, was Cezanne. Though Cezanne greatly admired Manet's work, the feeling was far from mutual. I will never commit myself with Monsieur Cezanne, he stubbornly declared as plans for the realist salon progressed. Manet's disgust for Cezanne's paintings may have been partly fed by the younger man's uncouth appearance and charmless personality, but he seems genuinely to have been appalled by Cezanne's canvases, which, despite the debt they owed to his own, were profoundly different in their inspiration. If Manet wished to represent his own visual impressions of the external world, whether of modern life or old master paintings, Cezanne, at this stage of his career, was obsessed with transferring onto canvas his own morbid and tormented inner world. As Castellari wrote, disapprovingly, of Cezanne's work, the natural world was merely a pretext for dreams and for subjective fantasies without any general echo in reason. The result of these fantasies had been a series of disconcertingly macabre scenes, such as The Strangled Woman, Painted in 1872, it showed a woman in a white dress being throttled by a figure of indeterminate sex, whose face is a cruel and sinister mask. Cezanne had also created a number of unsettling images of violent and unrestrained sexuality, including The Banquet of Nebuchadnezzar, an orgiastic vision of indistinct news writhing together amid the remains of a feast. Recently, Cezanne appeared to have tamed his wilder visions by turning his hand to plein air landscapes, at auvers sur oise the thatched village northeast of Paris, to which he had moved, on the advice of Pizarro in 1873. Nonetheless, Manet was convinced that throwing in his lot with such a pariah would be a grave mistake. Instead, he planned to submit four paintings, including the railway, to the 1873 salon. I will never exhibit in the shack next door, he claimed, spurning the advances of Degas and ignoring the fact that he had exhibited outside the official salon in 1863 and 1867. I enter the salon through the main door, he protested, and fight alongside all the others. The venue for the realist salon was to be Nadal's former photographic studio in the Boulevard des Capucines, a short walk from both the Café Tortoni and the Galerie Matinée. Though he had abandoned it a year earlier, Nadal still owned the lease on the studio, which consisted of a magnificent set of top-floor rooms with cast-iron pillars skylights and floor-to-ceiling windows. He generously lent the use of the rooms free of charge despite the fact that their annual rent, 30,000 francs, had virtually bankrupted him. Inspired by the location, Degas tried to persuade the group to call itself La Capucine, the Nasturtium, even going so far as to design a stylized Nasturtium, a plant with bright yellow or red flowers, as an emblem. The other members vetoed the idea, and in the end, the works would go on show under the long, prosaic title The Société Anonyme Cooperative à Capital Variable that had appeared on the charter. A catalogue for the exhibition was quickly prepared by Renoir's younger brother, Edmond, a budding journalist, while Renoir himself oversaw the hanging of 165 paintings, pastels and engravings by 30 artists. Among them were 10 works by Degas, including depictions of dancers and laundresses, nine by Monet, and five by Pizarro. Cézanne chose to show three works, among them a view of Ovel Souaz, entitled The House of the Hanged Man, and a curious phantasmagoria of blazing colour and shimmering forms called A Modern Olympia. This latter canvas, a pastiche of Manet's Olympia, showed a black maid unveiling a nude woman who lies curled on a bed, as a bearded man in a frock coat, possibly Cézanne's self-portrait, watches from a sofa, a black cat at his feet. Not a canvas destined to calm the worries of those members of the society, including even Degas and Monet, who had been entertaining doubts about the wisdom of exhibiting alongside Cézanne. Its appearance was secured only after much pleading by Pizarro. The doors of Nadal's studio opened to the public as planned on the 15th of April, with visitors paying one franc as an entrance fee, the same as for the salon, and 50 centimes for the catalogue. Despite notices in as many as 50 newspapers, the realist salon did not attract anything like the same numbers that visited the Salon des Refusés in 1863. Yet opening day still saw 175 people ascend the stairs to the studio, and the show's four-week run averaged more than 100 visitors per day.
ultimately attracting 3,500 members of the public. Predictably, the exhibition was greeted by some with mockery and distaste. A number of critics compared the paintings unfavorably with those shown in the Salon de Refusé, which was, sneered the reviewer for La Presse, a louvre in comparison to the exhibition on the Boulevard des Capucines. Cézanne in particular was singled out for censure and derision. Monsieur Cézanne, complained the reviewer for L'Artiste, seems no more than a kind of madman painting while suffering from delirium tremors. He was accused of attacking his canvases while under the influence of oriental vapours, that is, opium, and jokes circulated that he and many of his fellow painters accomplished their work by loading pistols with tubes of paint and discharging them at their canvases. Nonetheless, even critics repelled by the paintings could appreciate the point of the exhibition itself. Despite declaring indignantly that the debaucheries of the school are nauseating and revolting, the reviewer for La Presse still acknowledged that the realist salon represented not just an alternative to the salon, but a new road. For those who think art, in order to develop, needs more freedom than that granted by the administration. These exhibitors were, he proclaimed, the pioneers of the painting of the future. These painters of the future found themselves christened with a memorable name on the 25th of April, following a satirical review by Louis Loire in Le Chavavari. While compiling the exhibition catalogue, Edmond Renoir had been exasperated by the somewhat monotonous titles such as Le Havre, Fishing Boat Leaving Port, with which Monet labelled his canvases. Faced with yet another Le Havre seascape, a hazily indistinct sketch painted by Monet in the spring of 1872, he demanded a more alluring title, to which Monet replied, Why don't you just put Impression? Renoir duly named the canvas Impression, Sunrise. This title amused and irritated Loire, for whom, as for many other critics and sound goes, a picture was meant to be a story told in paint, not a fuzzy impression of the weather conditions. He therefore dubbed the painters in the Boulevard des Capucines with a pejorative nickname, entitling his article, Exhibition of the Impressionists. The name was immediately seized on by other critics, including those sympathetic to the artist's cause. If one was characterised by a word that explains them, wrote Castanari four days after Leroy's article, we will have to invent the new term, Impressionists. They are Impressionists, in so far as they render not the landscape itself, but the sensation produced by the landscape. The pioneers of the painting of the future had just been baptized, and no one who entered Nadal's old studio in the spring of 1874 was in any doubt as to who was the godfather. The scathing review in La Presse had called the group disciples of Monsieur Manet, oh, nice. and by June, a journal entitled Les Contemporains featured on its cover a caricature of Manet wearing a crown and wielding a paintbrush as his scepter. The caption read, Manet, King of the Impressionists. Manet's decision to send his paintings to the Palais des Champs-Élysées instead of the Boulevard des Capucines had been based partly on the fact that each of his offerings since 1868 had been accepted for the salon. He was exasperated and dismayed, therefore, when the 1874 jury turned down two of the four works that, under the terms of the new regulations, he was allowed to submit. His rejected paintings were a scene of modern life, called A Masked Ball at the Opera, and a landscape, Swallows, painted the previous summer during a family holiday at berck sur near Boulogne. Added to the humiliation of rejection was the fact that since both works had already been sold, they would be returned to their owners, ignominiously imprinted to the Red Arm. Manny's two accepted paintings, The Railway, and a watercolour of a polichinelle went on show when the 1874 salon opened at the beginning of May. The success of Le Bon Bot proved a full storm, as the railway attracted blanket coverage in the press, virtually all of it unfavourable. The enigmatic scene of Victorine Laurent sitting before a cast iron railing, a much more difficult scene to interpret and appreciate than Le Bon Bot, was relentlessly lampooned in journals such as La Vie Parisienne and Le Journal de Muson. The satirist variously pretended to believe it depicted lunatics in an asylum, a mother and a daughter confined in a prison, or a woman inexplicably clutching a baby seal. The reviewers were equally unsparing. 
all the usual complaints were registered. The clumsy facture, the ignoble subject matter, the general unintelligibility. Even critics well disposed towards Manet struggled to appreciate the railway. Zola, coming the salon for Le Semaphore de Marseille, passed over the work in silence, while Philip Berti lamented Manet's incompetence of painting hands, not the first time someone had murmured about this perceived shortcoming. And Ernest Chesneau allowed that Manet's summary methods may look brutal at times. Still, Chesneau argued that this brutal style constituted a bold and honest attempt on the part of Manet to free his art from technical conventions and to express modern life exactly as it is. The problem for Manet, as ever, was that the jurors, the critics, and the public did not, on the whole, wish to see either expressions of modern life or violations of technical conventions. Their tastes were much better represented by the 1874 Salon's greatest attraction, Jérôme's Lenon's Gris, The Great Eminence, which was awarded the Grand Medal of Honor and sold to an American collector for 60,000 francs. A highly wrought historical tableau of flowing robes and plumed hats, it depicted Cardinal Richelieu's influential and secretive confessor, a grey frocked Capuchin priest named Tremblay, descending a palatial staircase. His nose, obliviously in a breviary, as a dozen obsequious courtiers bow before him in one long cascading flurry. Accomplished with Jerome's usual virtuoso brushwork, it perfectly answered the public's demands for painting to tell a comprehensible story and to beguile them with its visual charms. Lemonon's Gris, therefore, provided a bracing antidote for all those disturbed by either the railway or the canvases in the Boulevard des Capucines. It also suggested just how far the King of the Impressionists was from deposing the reigning deities and prevailing tastes of the Salon. Manet's disappointments at the 1874 Salon led him to a kind of show of solidarity with his fellow outcasts, the Impressionists, and in particular with Claude Monet. Manet and Monet had come a long way since 1865, when the former had angrily refused to make the acquaintance of the latter. They got to know one another sometime in the late 1860s, when Manet invited the younger painter to the Café de Bois, at which point Monet later recalled, we immediately became firm friends. Monet was to look back on these evenings in Manet's company at the Café de Bois as vital to his artistic development. Nothing could have been more interesting than our discussions, he claimed, with their constant clashes of opinion. They kept our wits sharpened, encouraged us to press forward with our own experiments, and gave us the enthusiasm to work for weeks on end. Manet had provided material as well as intellectual support, since in 1871 he had found Monet a house in Argentoy when the latter returned from England. Though he still had a studio in Paris, by 1874 Monet was firmly established at Argentoy. He failed to sell any of the works exhibited in Nadal's studio, where Impression, Sunrise, languished on the wall despite a modest price tag of a thousand francs. But his paintings continued to find enough favour in the marketplace that he planned to move into a larger house. In the middle of June, he signed the lease on a newly built house, complete with a large garden, next door to the one where he had lived the previous 18 months. The rent was a not inconsiderable 1,200 francs per month, but Monet was determined to enjoy the fruits of his labours. He hired a maid and a gardener, and he took to drinking fine wines from Bordeaux instead of the local vintage. Finally, he allowed himself one more luxury, a small rowboat in which he began plying the arms of the Seine in the wide stretch of the Argentoy Basin. Following the example of Daubigny, he took his canvas and paint box on board for expeditions, dropping anchor at likely vantage points and painting numerous scenes of regattas and riverbanks. This suburban island suited him so well that he was more productive than ever in the summer of 1874, completing 40 canvases in the space of a few short months. Monet's happiness that summer was further boosted by the regular presence of a visitor from Paris. Manet had decided to forego his traditional trip to the seaside in favour of remaining in the environs of Paris. Choosing to stay for a few weeks in the family home at Gennevilliers, he found himself back in the environment in the vibrantly modern world of bathers, boaters and casual pleasure seekers that a dozen years earlier had inspired Le Déjeuner Soulot. On this occasion, though, his style of painting had changed. He may not have esteemed the efforts of Cézanne and Renoir, but Monet was a different matter. Seven years earlier, Manet had disdained the Garden of the Princess, one of Monet's plein air cityscapes, when he saw it in a dealer's window. 
At that time, he believed paintings of La Vie Moderne were best realized in the studio, not under the open skies. Slowly, however, he'd come to accept, largely on the evidence of Monet's canvases, that the fashionable and fugitive world of what Baudelaire called modernity could be captured in situ. He had painted en plein air on previous occasions, most notably during his seaside vacations. But he seems to have come to the Argentoy Basin in the summer of 1874 with the express aim of abandoning what he would call the false shadows of the studio in favour of joining Monet in the true light of the outdoors. For the first time in his career, Manet tried to catch the effects of natural light. He carried his canvases to the same riverbank that Monet had been painting so prolifically, and following Monet's lead, replaced the sombre colours and sharp contrasts of so many of his earlier canvases with a lighter palette of blues, yellows and ochres, which he added to his canvas in strokes of pure, unmixed colour. He even painted, as a kind of tribute, Claude Monet and his wife on his floating studio, a portrait of his friend at work, his easel propped on the gunwale, and Camille inside the boat's makeshift cabin. Nautical pursuits along this reach of the Seine had become fashionable in the previous two decades, and anyone hoping to witness the picturesque amusement of modern Parisians could do no better than to visit, as Manet made sure to do that summer, the Circle de la Voile, or Seine Club at Argentoy. Besides the portrait of Monet in the boat, he painted four further scenes of sailors and boaters at Argentoy. In one of these canvases, simply entitled Boating, Manet posed his brother-in-law, Rudolf Lehnhoff, then 31, in the stern of a skiff, a young woman in a blue dress beside him. Another canvas, Argentoy, showed Rudolf and another young woman seated on a bench beside the marina, the luminous blues of the river fractured by the white of the sails in the middle distance. The stiff postures and blank expressions of these two figures, as well as the whiff of moral delinquency, recalled numerous of Manet's earlier paintings but they also indicated the enduring appeal for him, even outdoors, of the human form. This fascination would make his work distinct from that of Monet, whose only real pictorial concern was the incidental effect on the landscape of the weather, the hour, or the season. The lighter tones and saturated colours of both boating and Argentoy show how Manet had left the studio and stepped resolutely into the sunshine. Manet also painted one other canvas that summer at Argentoy. Visiting Monet's house in the Boulevard Saint-Denis one afternoon, he began painting the Monet family in their garden at Argentoy. The work portrayed Camille and Jean, then seven years old, seated on the grass amid the sprawl of her white dress. Nearby, a blue-smocked Monet stooped over one of the borders in his beloved garden, a watering can at his feet. Monet ceased gardening at some point that afternoon, and then he, too, started painting. Turning his attention to his guest, he began working on Manet painting in Monet's garden, showing Manet seated before his easel in a long coat and wide-rimmed hat. Hardly had he begun painting when Renoir arrived at the house and, finding the two men so engaged, borrowed paints and a canvas from Monet and started his own work. Madame Monet and her son with Camille and Jean reclining on the lawn as in Manet's canvas. The day ended with Manet and Renoir making gifts of their paintings to Monet. The pioneers of the painting of the future, three men working outdoors in a suburban garden, their canvases catching reflections from one another like rays of the sun. Epilogue, finishing touches. The Société Anonyme Cooperative à Capital Variable des Artistes, Peintres, Sculptures, Graveurs et Lithographes was dissolved in December 1874 after its members failed to sell many paintings from their exhibition or make much in the way of profit from their enterprise. However, in 1876, many of the same painters regrouped for a second show, this time at Durand Noël's Paris Gallery, under the prosaic banner Exhibition Made by a Group of Artists. Fewer visitors attended than in 1874, and the reviews, particularly one by Albert Wolff, that denounced the painters as a group of unfortunate creatures stricken with the mania of ambition, were even worse. Nonetheless, the art critic for the New York Tribune, Henry James, wrote that this exhibition by the irreconcilables, as he christened them, was decidedly interesting. 
The following year, in April, a third show was held in a vacant apartment on the third floor of a building in the Rue La Pelletier. On this occasion, a dwindling number of participants, only 18 braved the exhibition, finally took ownership of Louis Leroy's term of abuse, calling themselves Impressionists, and even publishing a short-lived journal called L'Impressionniste to defend their efforts against their critics. The results were much the same as on the two previous occasions. Five more exhibitions would follow. By the time of the eighth and last Paris show in 1886, Durand-Ruel had mounted successful retrospectives of paintings by the Impressionists of Paris in both London in 1882 and 1883 and New York in 1886. The exhibition in New York was staged at the American Art Galleries and continued due to popular demand at the National Academy of Design. Organized under the auspices of the American Art Association, it featured 289 works of art and proved particularly gratifying in terms of both sales and reviews. According to the New York Tribune, American collectors of Messonnier, Cabanel, and Jerome, hoping to protect the value of their investments, had tried to queer the picture of the Impressionists by denouncing them in the press as utterly and absolutely worthless. The tactic ultimately failed as the American public remained unmoved by the prevailing tastes and long-standing prejudices in France. Do not believe the Americans are savages, Durand de Réal wrote to Fontaine Latour in 1886. On the contrary, they are less ignorant, less bound by routine than our French collectors. Unencumbered by the dogma of conservative institutions such as the École des Beaux-Arts, the Americans happily embraced what the French had been reviling for two decades as scandalous profanations of art. Paintings of modern life, ballet dances, Parisian street scenes, and the sunlit, willow-draped riverbanks at Pontoise or Argentoy endeared themselves to a new generation of American collectors and museum goers much more than moralistic interpretations of Greek myths, Roman history, or indeed Napoleonic battle scenes. In the decade following de Rennes New York exhibition, increasingly more American money was invested in Impressionist paintings. One of the primary American collectors was Louisine Havemeyer, a friend of the American Impressionist painter Mary Cassatt, and the wife of Henry O. Havemeyer, owner of the American Sugar Refining Company. By the 1890s, she had begun buying works by Monet, Pizarro, Degas, and Cezanne, ultimately putting together an unsurpassed collection of more than 100 Impressionist paintings to adorn her Tiffany-encrusted Romanesque star mansion on the corner of Fifth Avenue and East 66th Street. American painters had also taken note of the work of the Impressionists. Numerous American artists had trained in Paris in the second half of the 19th century, and in 1887, a journal reported that an American colony had gathered at Giverny, the village on the Seine to which Claude Monet had moved in 1883. Their pictures, noted the correspondent, revealed that they have got the blue-green color of Monet's Impressionism and got it bad. Oh. One of these painters, Theodore Earl Butler, married Monet's stepdaughter Suzanne at Giverny in 1892, an event charmingly commemorated by one of the great examples of American Impressionism, Theodore Robinson's The Wedding March. By the first years of the 20th century, the style had taken such a firm root in American soil that many local varieties, Connecticut Impressionism, California Impressionism, Pennsylvania Impressionism, had been produced as Germain Bazin, chief conservator of the Louvre during the 1950s, was later to write, exaggerating only slightly, the Impressionists entered America without resistance. Seventeen canvases by Edouard Manet were included in Jolain de Royale's watershed exhibition in New York in 1886. However, Manet cannot properly be called an Impressionist, not only because he refused to take part in any of the Impressionist exhibitions in Paris, but also because of his different stylistic preoccupations, such as his fondness of the old masters, and for rendering the human form, rather than his Argentoy canvases notwithstanding, the effects of open-air light. Throughout the 1870s, he had remained determined to show his work at the Palais des Champs-Élysées, rather than in the shack next door. As in the 1860s, neither the jurors nor many of the critics treated him kindly. Unveiling his sun-drenched new style at the 1875 Salon, he received appalling reviews for Argentoy. While in the following year, the 10th anniversary of the jury of assassins, history repeated itself as both of his canvases were spurned by the jury. Not until the Salon of 1881 did he enjoy any real success, when he was awarded a Salon Medal. 
albeit only a second-class one, for portrait of Henri Rochefort. The Grand Medal of Honour was claimed that year by Paul Baudry. At the close of that year, thanks to his friend Antonin Proust, who had become Minister of Fine Arts in a government formed by Leon Gambetta, he received the Legion of Honour. Much to Manet's disgust, a letter of congratulations arrived from Italy, from his old adversary, the Comte de Novico, who retired to a villa near Luca. Tell him I appreciate his good wishes, Manet wrote to a mutual friend, Ernest Chesneau, but that he could have been the one to decorate me. He would have made my fortune, and now it's too late to compensate for twenty lost years. In 1882, Manet exhibited the remarkable A Bar of the Folie Bergère, one of the finest works in his entire oeuvre, but found himself disillusioned as ever with the bewildered public reaction. It was to be his final salon. He was seriously ill by this time, having finished the painting despite suffering pains and problems with his physical coordination, caused by a syphilitic infection contracted many years earlier. In April 1883, his gangrenous left leg was amputated below the knee. He died less than a fortnight later, on the 30th of April, at the age of 51. Almost 20 years to the day after Le Déjeuner sur l'Orbe was first revealed at the Salon de Refusé. He was buried at the Cimetière de Passy with Émile Zola and Claude Monet among the pallbearers. Edgar Degas, walking behind the coffin, expressed sentiments that much of the rest of France needed some time to appreciate. He was greater than we thought. Manet was indeed greater than many people thought, greater in particular than the critics and the fine arts administrators of the 1860s and 1870s had dared to consider. As early as eight months after his death, a retrospective exhibition of his work was mounted at, of all places, the École des Beaux-Arts, the institution in which, 20 years earlier, Jerome had tried to ban all mention of his name. This exposition Manet was treated to the sort of favourable reviews that the painter had so often been denied during his lifetime. Mm -hmm. Then, in February 1884, a large selection of his work, including 90 oil paintings, went to auction. A respectable, if unspectacular, 116,000 francs was raised. A bar at the Folie Bergère was one of the pricier lots, going to a friend, the composer Emmanuel Chabrier, for 5,850 francs. But the most expensive, to the guffawing of many spectators at the auction, proved to be Olympia, which was purchased by Manet's brother-in-law, Ferdinand Lehnhoff, for 10,000 francs. The fortunes of the Déjeuner sur l'Orbe and Olympia served as barometers for Manet's reputation in the decades after his death. The latter canvas, easily the most notorious painting of the 19th century, became surprisingly the first of his works to enter the Louvre, albeit not without the usual controversy. The painting's museological beautification occurred only thanks to the untiring efforts of Claude Monet. In a feat of almost unexampled selflessness as an artist, Monet spent an entire year of 1889 organising a public subscription to purchase the canvas from Manet's family for installation in the Louvre. Nearly 20,000 francs was raised from subscribers who included Degas, Pizarro, Renoir, Fantin Latour, Antonin Proust and Philippe Berti. However, the work was sent by the government not to the Louvre, but to the Musée du Luxembourg, the Museum of Living Artists. Here it was joined in 1897 by two more of Manet's works, including the balcony, which had been bequeathed to the nation by the Impressionist painter, patron and collector, Gustave K. Watt. However, two more of Manet's works from K. Watt's collection, Croquet at Boulogne, and a small sketch of racehorses, were refused by the Luxembourg, whose curator, Léon Benedict, would later publish a biography of Messonnier. From the same bequest, Benedict turned down some 30 paintings by Monet, Pizarro, Renoir, Degas, and Seisley. Olympia was consecrated by the French artistic establishment only in 1907, when it entered the Louvre on the orders of Georges Clemenceau, at the time the president of the Council of Ministers, as well as a long-standing friend of Monet, and the subject of an 1880 Manet portrait. The work was afforded the honour of hanging on the wall beside Angers' Grand Orleans, another work that had once been savaged by the critics. Coincidentally, also in 1907, Pablo Picasso, then 26, painted Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, his first Cubist painting that featured a stunning new approach to representing the new female form. Two years earlier, 
a number of other young artists, including Henri Matisse and Maurice de Vlaminck, outraged the French public with works whose flat compositions and splodges of vivid classic colour, a shocking style that won them the pejorative nickname Les Fauves, the Wild Beasts, oh. were called the Wild Boar of the Batignolles. And Olympia entered the Louvre two years before Filippo Martinetti published his Futurist Manifesto in Le Figaro, praising courage, audacity, and revolt, and asserting in art history's ultimate tribute to modern life that a speeding motor car was more beautiful than the winged victory of Saint-Mathéry's. A generation after his death, Manet had left behind a vibrant cultural legacy, not simply through scandalising the public, an option that artists of the past century have found all too expedient, but by recasting artistic tradition in his own idiosyncratic vision in order to forge entirely new forms. Within this context, Charles Ullmont, a professor at the Sorbonne, was able to declare as early as 1912 that Olympia marks a momentous date in the history of 19th century painting and art generally. Or, as a more recent art historian, Professor T.J. Clark has written, Olympia is the founding monument of modern art. Le Déjeuner sur l'Eure, meanwhile, has staked its own claim as a foundation of modern art. Few serious artists have managed to escape its spell. It inspired Claude Monet's own Le Déjeuner sur l'Eure, as well as Cézanne's numerous paintings of male and female nudes, bathing in streams and lounging on riverbanks. Most transfixed of all, though, was Picasso, who was born just 18 months before Manet died. Le Déjeuner sur l'Eure inspired him more than any other painting. One can see the intelligence in each of Manet's brushstrokes, he once wrote to a friend. Ultimately, Picasso would produce some 200 versions of the work, 150 drawings, 27 oil paintings, and even a number of cardboard models, from which 13-foot-high statues were created from sandblasted concrete, and sent to adorn the sculpture garden of the Moderna Museet in Stockholm. He was attempting to dissect this most enigmatic of paintings, probing it from every angle with his pencil and brush, repeatedly taking it apart and putting it back together in a struggle to divine the secret of its power and mystique. Picasso had first seen the Légion de in 1900, when it was shown at the Universal Exposition in Paris, in a room in the Grand Palais that the Fine Arts Administration grudgingly dedicated to Impressionism. The 76-year-old Jerome had tried to prevent Émile Loubet, the French president, from entering the room by exclaiming, Stop, sir, for in there France is dishonoured. Thirty-seven years after its appearance at the Salon des Refusés, paintings by the members of the École de Batignolles still had the power to provoke and offend. The Déjeuner sur l'Eure had a much longer wait than Olympia for its consecration. It had first been bought in 1878 for 3,000 francs by Jean-Baptiste Feuillard, a singer who had acquired Le Bon Bloc five years earlier for double that price. Two decades later, it was purchased for 55,000 francs by the collector and art historian Etienne Moreau Neleton, who willed the work to the French nation in 1906. The canvas was deposited not in the Louis proper, but rather in a bizarre act that revealed lingering official hostilities in a room in the Louvre then occupied by the Ministry of Finance. Not until 1934 did the officials of the Louvre see fit to place the Déjeuner sur l'Eure in the part of the building concerned with the fine arts rather than fiscal policy. Both works were subsequently moved in 1947 to what became known as the Impressionist Museum, the Musée de Jeux de Pomme. Situated in the northwest corner of the Jardin des Tuileries, in a building Napoleon III had constructed to house tennis courts, this new museum was, as the Louvre's chief conservator declared, a triumphant temple to a style of art that by then had gained a worldwide popularity. In that year, okay. an admiring American art historian, Robert Goldwater, declared of Le Déjeuner sur le, no other painter of the century managed to get so much into a canvas. Okay, we've been at this, whoops, hi, we've been at this for a long time and I really need a break. As you can see, I filled in the couch, or I've been filling in the couch, um, different areas of it working on her skirt, working on her leg placement, which of course is not quite right. Um, there's, there's a lot that has to be done, adjusted and readjusted, but I need a break. I'm very sweaty and I need to turn on my AC, wash my face and hands, and take a little break, because I'm pooped. 
This is mentally and physically exhausting, as silly as it sounds, and I'm there, so mainly sweaty. But I'm going to stop, I'm going to have a snack, drink some coffee, cool off a little bit, and um, there we are. All right. Um, yeah, there we are. Ciao.